Rowdy, and um, I, I wanted to just introduce this film a little bit, and then we'll do a Q&A afterwards. Um, my work really is in the era of, area of healthcare advocacy. This film is more about campaign finance reform, um, but we find that all these things are interlinked at this point in our society when it's difficult to pass sensible legislation because our democracy is kind of held up by lobbying and uh, campaign uh, finance issues. So uh, this film that we're gonna watch was done by a person that's grown to be a friend of mine, Richard Master, who's a corporate CEO in Pennsylvania. His company is MCS Corporation and they make frames and, and, uh, and mirrors. And they, um, they have about 200 employees and he spends a lot of money on healthcare. And a couple of years ago, he realized how much he was spending and he was on a trip to Chile with uh, his son and his son's fiance from Chile and they needed some medication and he went to the phar pharmacy and bought it and realized how cheap um, uh, drugs can be in other countries. And he came back to the States and he started researching and he got a film producer and he went out and made a movie called Fix It, Healthcare at the Tipping Point that talks about the business and economic case for a truly universal healthcare system like most of the industrialized countries have in the world. Then he did a film the next year, and he came to Oregon, toured with the film. We showed it to rotary clubs, to business groups, to people all over the state, and he's a very articulate spokesperson for the issue. Then the next year, he did a film called Big Pharma, uh, uh, Market Failure, which talks about pharmaceutical prices and how they've gone out of control and how that's a big problem that we need to solve in this country. And then both of those things taught him that we really need to get into campaign finance reform so that our Congress people and our legislators aren't so beholden to the special interests that are keeping us from getting to some of these sensible policies. So this film deals with that subject. I'm not an expert on it, but I can tell you a little bit about what I know is gonna be happening this year in Oregon on these issues after we do the film and then we can do a Q&A. Then we'll move on to the second hour, which is a presentation on kind of the history of the movement toward universal health care worldwide, but here in the States and in Oregon, um, it seems like we've been doing this for a long time and we can talk about that. So. Uh, let's get started with the movie first, and then we'll talk. Eastern Coach Company has 700 employees in 14 locations throughout eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey. 80-some percent of our revenue comes from contracts with transportation authorities and municipalities. Mm. In the end of the day, if I squeeze out 2 or 3 percent at the bottom, I'm doing great. Much more than any other cost of my financial statement, I worry about health insurance because of its unpredictability. We just can't deal with double-digit increases every year and survive. Over the last 10-year period, healthcare costs have grown radically. It's over $2 million for 150 people on our plan. We've seen seriously ill people costing our plan for $500,000 each. A driver for us was diagnosed with a condition that is going to cost me at least $200,000 this year. It could cost me that for several years. There's no surgery. It's all drug treatments. They, they aren't rare conditions. The things that people who work for me are going to get. We've got 4% of the world's population, and we're paying 40% of the world's drug bills. We're paying twice as much on average for these drugs. And that makes it a tremendous challenge to keep productive jobs in the United States. Every other country in the world negotiates drug prices. You see the Congress passing a law that Medicare cannot negotiate price. They have to pay for almost every drug and at the price that the manufacturer establishes. They got it with hundreds of thousands of dollars of lobbying expenditure per member of Congress. 
over a period of years. This is not the democracy we grew up with. It's the big money agenda. Every law and rule is scrutinized by lobbyists, and that ensures that in combination with the contributions, that every law and rule is spun to the advantage of the special interest, which means that almost nothing is ever advanced you know, in the common interest, which fundamentally undermines the republic. Big money fights against anything that limits or reduces their profit. It costs all of us as taxpayers, costs us dearly. We all pay the price. Three ODs arrived by ambulance in the hour or so we were there, two more the next day. It's not even 10.30 in the morning in Huntington, West Virginia, and it's happened again. Another overdose. A particularly ugly recent example of big money lobbying against the common good is the opioid crisis. This is where I now come to see my son. Ooh, it's just, it's, it's so big. It's so out of control. Thousands of Americans are dying every year in a massive epidemic of opioid addiction fueled by the pharmacy industry and the major corporate distributors who work with them. The DEA did the best they could, and they were prosecuting a lot of people, and they were prosecuting these pill mills and these doctors who were just setting up shop to sell opioids. But then there were things that went on with lobbying Congress for laws that basically tied the hands of the DEA. James died in 2014, in August. At the time, he was struggling with addiction, and I was a member of a parent support group I believe we've now lost 22 children from one small support group, and we are losing 58,000 people in this country to overdose every year. Of those people who die of a heroin overdose, 80% of them became addicted first to prescription painkillers. I didn't really think I had to talk to my son about drugs that were prescribed by a doctor. Jake was an awesome kid. When he walked into the room, his eyes just sparkled when he smiled, and he was always laughing and happy. He was going to college. He had a job. You know, he had lots of friends. He had a bright future ahead of him. One small town in West Virginia of 390-some people got shipments of 9 million opioid pills over the course of a few years. The DEA whistleblowers we talked to said that happened again and again and again. With over $100 million in lobbying money and millions in campaign contributions, Farmer was able to pass a law that severely restricted enforcement. Why are these people sponsoring bills when people in their backyards are dying from drugs that are coming from the same people that these bills are protecting. I don't know how any politician voted to gut the enforcement of the regulations around opioids. It's reprehensible. Congress's restriction on the DEA's ability to do strict opioid enforcement is just one tragic example of the damage done by the big money agenda. Just as Big Pharma manipulated Congress to protect their distribution of dangerous opioids, Pharma has also made sure that Congress protects its ability to impose higher and higher pricing on the medicines that people need. Prices for branded drugs are generally twice what is paid in other countries. Out of control Pharma prices cost us all in higher insurance premiums, higher taxes, and flat wages. Pharmaceutical companies have been able to protect a very profitable status quo because of their ability to spend so much money to influence elections and legislation. Big Pharma alone spent two and a half billion dollars in the last 10 years lobbying Congress. It cost our citizens billions of excess dollars 
and forces millions of our citizens to avoid taking the drugs that they need. Big money fights against reform across a wide range of issues. The influence of these different sectors from pharma to the fossil fuel industry, to the chemical industry and the like, are exerting tremendous influence on the politics here in America through the influence of their monies being poured into elections and lobbying. But we also see them pouring money into the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And that's really working at the detriment of many other businesses across the country. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce does not represent small and medium-sized businesses like my business. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is a reliable ally for big business, for the pharmaceutical industry, for the insurance industry, for any industry able and willing to write a big check to the U.S. Chamber. And with that big check, they can get assurance from the chamber that they will lobby on the industry's behalf. I've run political campaigns for 20 years. I have told people at local Republican meetings for two decades that the U.S. Chamber is not your friend. The chamber and big business are the friend of whoever just won. The small business has no chance. And that's the aha moment for a lot of conservatives when they realize, oh, that's right. Your entrepreneurs are your conservative base. The small and mid-sized business community is the foundation of the American economy. We serve an important role. We employ people. Well, I put food on the table of 700 households. Their well-being is in our hands. I think that should get me some influence, but the truth is it doesn't. How do we fight against these people that are putting hundreds of millions of dollars up against us? Forces within the economy continue to exist and profit because they're able to write the rules and rig the game. And that's not capitalism. That's 100% cronyism. Cronyism is when big money people fix the rules of the game. As a business person, I'm offended by cronyism. I want a level playing field. What we typically see in crony capitalism is a situation in which very large corporate interest or special interest are able to keep small businesses from getting into the marketplace. Whenever a patent period for a significant branded drug comes due, the company will go to its allies in Congress. They will do everything behind the scenes to prevent generics from coming in and lowering our prices. That's cronyism in action. Whenever a piece of legislation comes before Congress that would have a broad positive effect on the common good, it either gets derailed or gutted. Things that the American public want just aren't considered seriously. There may not be any better example than the debate over health care that led to the passage of the Affordable Care Act. We are done. During the debate over what became the Affordable Care Act, more than 4,500 lobbyists swarmed the Capitol. That's eight lobbyists for every member of Congress. $1.2 billion was spent overall. Pharma alone spent $266 million to make sure that the Affordable Care Act would not include any controls on drug prices. The return on investment to influence Congress, whether by lobbying, campaign funding, or PR ads, is immense. The Sunlight Foundation did a several-year study to track the payoff on lobbying and campaign finance investment. They found that while Big Pharma spent tens of millions of dollars lobbying to prevent Medicare from negotiating drug prices, it got pharma tens of billions of dollars in profits in return. Across the board, lobbying investments pay off in massive profits or massive tax cuts, while working people and small businesses pay the price. The current political system denies citizens equal representation inside of a representative government. Our democracy is at stake with this issue. What our founding fathers had in mind about the principles and the integrity of our system. The 
founders in creating a new country, rebelling against Britain, were rebelling against what they thought of as a fundamentally corrupt system. The reason it was corrupt is that you had a aristocracy of wealth and power, which was able to buy government action and control government. The country was founded basically out of a concept of the common good. What the founders were most concerned about was the distortion of governing by the special interests. The founders' ideal of the common good essentially broke down. Theodore Roosevelt returned from, from the, the time of the founders to, to Teddy Roosevelt's presidency. Powerful money gradually took over and corrupted the system. And the will of the people was disregarded. We had reached a, a tipping point of monopolies and, and corruption. So it was clear that something had to be done. When Teddy Roosevelt came into office, he knew that he had to take on the big monopolies, the major corporate power but he knew he would first have to take on their political power, which meant taking on campaign finance reform, because those corporations were making contributions directly to members of Congress, and he knew that to be able to get antitrust laws passed through Congress, he would first have to break the link between the corporations and Congress, which meant breaking the link between their money and the candidates' campaigns. So one of his first acts was to passed the Tillman Act in 1907, which banned corporate contributions to political campaigns. So the history of the U.S. is a history of the ebb and flow of corruption and money that infiltrates our system, leading up to the 1970s when massive campaign contributions were once again corrupting the system. Those people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. With the Watergate scandal and the corrupting influence of money on our politics, the public was pushed to the tipping point and demanded reform. The question is, how long is the American public going to put up with a small group of men and organizations determining the political process by deciding who can run and who can't run? Congress passed a series of reform laws that were designed to make elections less expensive and prevent members of Congress, candidates, the president, which was at issue there, from raising literally million-dollar contributions. The Watergate scandal resulted in some very important reforms Most Americans wanted to clean up politics right after Watergate. A Republican president said the Times demand this legislation. Now, most of those safeguards and those rules after Watergate have eroded and been disregarded completely by the political class. We thought we had corruption under control, but again, corrupting money flowed back into our system. I would have thought we learned our lessons from the Watergate scandal that having huge sums of money contributed to groups controlled by candidates or to political parties is simply a danger sign for a democracy. Citizens United was a Supreme Court case that was handed down in 2010. What the majority argued in that decision is that corporate spending in a political context was an act of speech and therefore should be unregulated. It should be limitless. The court in the Citizens United case has said a whole lot of things that I would think appear corrupt, most citizens would think appear corrupt, are not in fact, as a legal matter, going to qualify as corruption. I'm afraid at least for the time being that's going to be the case because of the most misguided, naive, uninformed, egregious decision of the United States Supreme Court, I think, in the 21st century. When Richard Nixon was drawn into legal trouble because of the influence that was peddled inside the White House, where people would bring suitcases filled with like $250,000, that won't happen today because nobody needs to do it in such a crude way today. All you need to do is to wire money to a super PAC, and that's perfectly legal, even though it has exactly the same effect on the president or on a member of Congress. All those things we were worried about, that never happens anymore. What happens is the equivalent in legal form 
ratified by the structures that the Supreme Court has forced onto our political system, such as super PACs. Super PACs, by law, are not supposed to be coordinating in any way with a candidate's campaign, but it happens all the time, and it does because the FEC is just paying no attention to this. What is a super PAC? It raises and spends money making public ads that impact individual campaigns. Single-payer health care, sanctuary cities, job-crushing taxes, and big cuts to our military. Pelosi's San Francisco values are wrong for America. There is money that is surging in, hundreds of millions of dollars that wasn't there the day before the Citizens United decision. Longtime political operatives realize the opportunity to game the system by setting up these patriotic sounding organizations that were ostensibly to benefit society, but were in fact political organizations through which they could raise and spend tens of millions, ultimately hundreds of millions of dollars with no transparency about where the money was coming from. It's just a fraud perpetrated on our democracy. By federal law, there's a legal limit on the amount an individual can directly donate to a candidate for Congress. The current maximum is $2,700 per election. The law was passed by Congress to minimize the influence by an individual on the political process. The very idea of campaign donation limits has been undermined by super PACs. Super PACs can funnel unlimited amounts of money that support the candidate but technically are not coordinating with the candidate's campaign. And the money can be given anonymously. Super PACs pump in millions of dollars running negative ads, often spending more than the candidate's official campaign. Unlimited and anonymous money in campaigns is fundamentally undermining the democracy. It's against the expressed intent of Congress. The Citizens United Supreme Court decision opened the floodgates to unlimited dark money. Big oil polluters, they have a friend in Pennsylvania, millionaire Pat Toomey. What's the truth? Katie McGinty helped steer millions of our tax dollars to favored contracts. Toomey versus McGinty in 2016 in Pennsylvania the most expensive senatorial race in the history of Pennsylvania. 70% of the money raised by outside groups. Katie McGinty has no shame. Club for Growth Action is responsible for the content of this advertising. He's helping big oil polluters and millionaires, not the rest of us. MCV Victory Fund is responsible for the content of this advertising. 20,000 TV ads over a two, three month period in the Philadelphia region alone, drowning out the natural discourse that we would expect between the candidates so that we could properly evaluate the worth of one candidate versus the other. It undermines the fundamental intentions and purpose of an election. If you step back and you ask, well, so how much did the people learn? Nobody is understanding anything. All they are getting is reasons to hate one side or the other. Politics of hate is quite fruitful. In just the Missouri race for U.S. Senate, incumbent Republican Senator Roy Blunt and Democratic challenger Secretary of State Jason Kander have raised around $14 million. Most of that money comes from sources outside of Missouri. Now, many people in the U.S. have negative feelings about so-called dark money. It's the money that gets spent, that never gets reported, that never goes into an FEC report, that never gets discussed in the news. And what we know is that when something is hidden, people behave very differently. And Quist has a long pattern of failing to pay his bills. He's even faced multiple warrants for not paying his taxes. And you don't know when those negative ads are going to be pouring into your district. It could be the last 30 days. The dark money, the secret money, the super PAC money that's flowing in, are all these snakes now under the rock. But when you lift that rock up for our electoral system, you know it's poisonous. It's negative. 
It is not good for the system. John Ossoff really wants you to think he's ready to be in Congress. I'm Han Solo, Captain of the Millennium Falcon. Sorry, Johnny, but the truth strikes back. Congressional Leadership Fund is responsible for the content of this advertising. So the problem is in the third party, you pretty much can be as negative as you want, say anything you want with nothing to back it up. I mean, short of something that's going to put you in prison, you're free to hit as hard as you want. Our fiscal conservative leaders, men we admire, aspire to be men like Tom Campbell, who would never lead us astray, his pedestal so high. Leaving but one way to fall. You know, the way Washington works, it's not based just on quid pro quos, like, I'll do something for you. It's also based on sort of the opposite, which is, if you cross us, I will destroy you. What they're being told is, you know, we happen to have this super PAC that has millions of dollars that destroys people. And by the way, we've got this one little provision we need in the budget, and it's really important to us and our constituents. It'll create a lot of jobs after it gives us a lot of money. And back to that other unrelated thing, we have this super PAC that, you know, destroys people who oppose us. <laughs> Dark money has an insidious impact on our politics, but lobbyists bundling and donating money directly to congressional candidates is an even more blatant example of corruption. The leadership of both parties generally tells them that losing a freshman seat is a disaster for them, so they tell them, your focus needs to be on getting reelected. So therefore, we're gonna introduce you, in essence, to a bunch of people who have ready money, who can help you pay off your debt. Now, where's the easiest source of money for these people? The folks hanging around two blocks away, the lobbyists. They have their checkbooks out. They're dripping in money. They want to give you the money. It starts even before they're inaugurated. I've been a registered lobbyist since 1987. The role of lobbyists in Washington is vastly misunderstood. <laughs> Most people ply their trade very much above board. You're trying to provide accurate information to members and staff. There's a very small part of the lobbying community, however, that plays this uh, transactional game, the pay to play. Most lobbyists, and I'd say 90 plus percent of them, are absolutely fine, absolutely decent, not giving resources because either they don't have them or they don't want to do it, and are trying to make their case on the merits. However, when a lobbyist like that runs up against a lobbyist like I was, they're dead. And in essence, that's the problem. Members of Congress face massive pressure from lobbyists. Lobbyists need powerful members to push their particular agendas. Faced with hundreds of competing interests, the member has to choose what legislation they're going to fight for or fight against. Lobbyists who raise campaign funds know that money will give them an inside track in pushing their agenda. They'll have a big advantage over lobbyists that don't put up money. It's good, old-fashioned pay-to-play. Money is a clear, corrupting influence. Fueled by the power of campaign contributions, members of Congress go to work for their donors. Maneuvering legislation through Congress or fighting to stop bills their donors don't want. Lobbyists should not be allowed to give anything of value to a member or to his or her campaign or to a political party. By law, lobbyists can't buy dinner and drinks for a member of Congress. But they are allowed to host campaign fundraising events and bundle hundreds of thousands of dollars in campaign donations for that same congressman. No other system in anything other than a banana republic is as corrupted as ours. I was speaking to the Swedish parliament, and I had dinner with some Swede representatives afterwards, and, and they literally could not believe that members raised money. This guy said to me, I've been in parliament for 20 years. I've never once asked anybody for money. And he said, I can't even imagine how I could do my job if I had to be asking people for money. What we can do, and what the South Carolina court has done, they have upheld a law passed by the state legislature in South Carolina that says you cannot be a lobbyist and directly give a check to a 
sitting legislator. Take the lobbyist giving out of the equation, I think that solves a lot of the pay-per-play issues we have with government. If we stop the money bundling by lobbyists, much of the pressure would be off the politicians. They don't like the money game. The relentless push to raise money has nothing to do with why most of them ran for office in the first place. It's really almost a vicious thing that we do to members of Congress. You know, they come in because they want to serve. Members of Congress spend extraordinary amounts of time raising campaign funds. Both parties expect their members to spend at least four hours a day dialing for dollars. They work out of small cubicles in call centers, especially set up by the parties. It's literally a telemarketing operation. House members are expected to raise over $2,500 a day. Senators, $15,000 a day. There is precious little time to effectively do their real job. Many don't read bills, don't attend hearings, and don't participate deeply in the legislative process. Their time is chewed up asking wealthy donors for money. They are pressured to follow the agenda set by their donors while ignoring the majority of their back home constituents. The voice of the people and the common good is drowned out by the voice of the big money agenda. They do not like having an intern come over from their respective party, take them over for call time, make them sit in a little cubicle, feed them Twinkies and soda to keep them going, and call people and ask for money all day. That's not why anyone ran for Congress. You're simply on the phone dialing wealthy individuals. And they have an agenda. There's no doubt about it. They're not taking your call to be nice to you. They want to tell you what their agenda is. No longer are you focused on your voters. You are focused on your economic constituents, the people who are making your election or re-election possible. They are on the hamster wheel of dialing for dollars day in, day out in order to be able to be a viable candidate in the next election. We hope they're squeezing in time for briefings, for study, for careful consideration of the weighty issues that we've asked them to grapple with on our behalf. Now we have a, a situation where many people don't even read the bills, let alone partake in crafting them. When they're raising money on the phone and they're dialing for dollars, you are not doing your committee work. You're not doing your oversight work. You're not the watchdog of the taxpayer funds and making government accountable. They're not reaching across the aisle. They're not formulating positions with their fellow colleagues in their own parties because they're so busy focusing on fundraising in their next election. Probably more than half the people on Capitol Hill are always looking around the corner to figure out how they can cash out as a result of their public service. And it's absolutely disgraceful. In 1974, 3% of members of Congress went from Capitol Hill to K Street to become lobbyists. Today, that number is 50%. You have members of Congress or public servants who work for the public and cash in and become lobbyists. And by the way, they're very effective lobbyists, at least initially, because they had the best contacts. If it's a very important bill, a very important piece of legislation, potentially offering great rewards or a great threat, to their bottom line. They're gonna hire a former committee member or a former member who can uh, meet with their colleagues on an almost one-to-one -one basis. One of the many reasons why it's so attractive for members of Congress to leave office and become a lobbyist is because they make 10 to 20 times as a lobbyist what they could make as a member of Congress. Pharma has an especially strong revolving door. It has nearly 1,400 registered lobbyists, and 65% of them came through the revolving door. <laughs> Billy Tozan pushed through the Medicare Part D prescription drug bill that meant billions of dollars in profits for pharma. He left Congress and went to work for pharma as their chief lobbyist. He made more than $19 million between 2006 and 2010. So there needs to be a longer period of time before a member of Congress can go into a lobbying job. 
If you had a five-year period before you could lobby Congress, that, it seems to me, might change what is now being seen as sort of a tryout for being a lobbyist. Now, Mr. Senator Cotton, listen to this. You work for us. The American people across the board are saying enough is enough. This system stinks to high heaven. Tear it all down. The politicians who are in the game right now really understand how deeply screwed up it is. Oh, we haven't even begun. I'm not done with you yet. I got the mic and I'm not going anywhere. Turn off the power. I got a very loud voice. This ain't over yet. California's Tom McClintock had to be escorted out by police. When I move around the country and talk to Republicans, when I look at polls of what Republicans are thinking, the people who are out of step here is the party leadership in Washington. The ideologues who are saying no regulation, the people in Congress who think they have a temporary partisan advantage. Both parties get money, especially when it comes to the pharmaceutical industry, where they've got lobbying teams covering both parties. They want to make sure that they've got control regardless of which party's in power. Data from Open Secret shows that for 2017, Pharma contributed to 127 Democratic and 126 Republican congressional campaigns. And they contributed to 44 Democratic Senate races and 30 Republican Senate races. They have strategically spent money to maximize their influence over both parties. Neither party is doing this any better than the other party. Campaign finance reform has become a top of mind issue for conservatives. When you give, they do whatever the hell you want them to do. You better believe it. And you know what? When I need something from them two years later, three years later, I call them. They are there for me. I think money corrupts the process. Concentrated wealth has concentrated power in Washington and that we can't get things done anymore. The system we have, I agree, it's totally broken. Candidates are increasingly dependent on the very, very wealthy. You know, the public, I think, over time is going to rebel against this. We need a level playing field, and we need to go back to the realization that Teddy Roosevelt had, that we have to have a limit on the flow of money, and that corporations are not people. I think that what you're seeing is actually the emergence of a right-left, cross-partisan movement to attack the hyper-concentration of wealth and power in this country. I'm all for this tax credit. For me, that's keeping $200 you're going to give the IRS and instead picking a candidate who will be a good steward of your money. Once someone gives a contribution, they get invested in their government. They start paying attention. They start talking to friends. They start getting friends to vote. They start having faith in the system again. We need to give citizens a stake back in their campaign finance system and local voters a stake back. I think if you can create this alternate funding that focuses the candidate back on their district, you fundamentally change how candidates run, how they're picked, and how they represent once they're in. And I think it would be very helpful to find a way to encourage local contributors, such as saying, if you raise money from inside your district or state, that is subject to a federal match. To give candidates and office holders an incentive to go back home and raise money, which is another way of connecting with voters, which is another way or leads to voters feeling that they're important again. We can reclaim our democracy with campaign finance reform. Limiting contributions to smaller amounts would increase the power of the common citizen and limit the power of big money. Combining small donations with a four to one match of public funding encourages candidates to raise money locally. A candidate that receives a $200 contribution would receive an $800 match from the government. A $200 contribution is worth $1,000 to the campaign. It reduces the influence of out-of-state money. Candidates become more responsive to their constituents. It moves the power back to the local voters. 
What we need is an amendment or a bill in Congress that publicly funds public elections. And if you required public funding of elections through the Constitution or if you paid for it through Congress, then all of these corrupting dependencies can fall away. It's a certainty that if we spent the money on public financing of elections matching small dollar contributions, we would save many times over what's being spent. As a business person, it makes total economic sense to publicly finance our campaigns. The tens of billions of dollars we could save through federally negotiating Medicare drug prices would save way more than we would spend on federally financing congressional elections. Connecticut, when they adopted their version of small dollar funded elections, in the first year, 78% of the elected representatives opted into that system voluntarily because their campaign managers told them, look, it makes more sense for us to go out there and get votes than to spend all our time in cocktail parties raising money from rich cats. And if they opted into the system, they would no longer be spending all of their time focused on what the tiniest fraction of the 1% care about. And they would have more time to try to figure out what the vast majority of Americans care about. That would be the way to deal with the problem of inequality caused by the way we fund campaigns. And Congress could pass that tomorrow and the Supreme Court would not touch it. There have been a number of court rulings that have upheld the constitutionality of public financing of campaigns. So long as candidates are not required to participate, that it's a voluntary program. America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter, if we fail, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. That's Lincoln, and that's so true with money and politics. So it comes down to a question of our own soul as a country and whether or not we're ready to fight back and force our elected officials to pass the kinds of laws necessary to clean up this mess. The biggest challenge we face in reform is to convince the public there's a reason to believe we could actually succeed in reform. Nobody in the public is against the idea of reform. They just don't believe there's anything you can do about it. There's this visceral and understandable anger on the part of tens of millions of Americans, which they're expressing in opinion polls, saying, hey, Washington, wake up. Stop this game. We want it stopped. We're prepared to take action. Stop ignoring us. The only way you fight back against money is to go and organize and to become involved in that system and to hold your elected representatives accountable. And you want to stand there, expect us to be calm, cool, and collective. Wow, what kind of insurance do you have? We have to just simply say we are powerful and start acting that way. That changes the public mood, it changes the political dynamics, and it changes the power leverage in our political system. If you look back at the civil rights movement, you look back at the women's movement, then the environmental movement, and even if you look back at the Tea Party movement, there's pretty good evidence that when people speak up and get organized, we know reform can be done. People have got to be willing to invest the time, the energy, their bodies themselves, and their passion. There is a movement in opposition of the big money agenda rising up across the country. We need to join these national organizations that exist and are actively pursuing legislation to stop this, the business community must participate in this movement. There is growing support for an amendment to the Constitution that would address many of the problems created by the Supreme Court's decisions on Citizens United and other court cases. And many states and cities around the country have passed resolutions calling for an amendment. And since the Citizens United decision was handed down, we've had states pass resolutions calling for a constitutional amendment. In Colorado in 2012, when they voted for an amendment to the U.S. Constitution to get back to controlling political money, there was virtually no difference between Republicans, Independents, and Democrats. They all voted within 70 to 75 percent, and they carried every single county in the state. 
We don't have to wait on Washington to address all the problems associated with money and politics, but lawmakers in Washington should look to see what is happening in the states. A lot of states and cities have passed laws that address money and politics, and many of them have created public financing of campaigns locally and at the state level. The solutions are straightforward. We need a constitutional amendment that gives Congress the authority to regulate the raising and spending of all money impacting federal elections. We need to overturn the Citizens United decision and not allow unlimited contributions to bogus nonprofits. No money should be dark, no source hidden. We need to require 100% transparency for all campaign spending. Lobbyists must be prohibited from raising campaign dollars. After leaving Congress, members must have at least a five-year waiting period before being allowed to work as a lobbyist. We need to fund campaigns with small donor contributions. These locally generated small donations would then be supplemented with public funds. If we can accomplish these things, healthcare reform and other reforms are feasible. Let's remove the taint on our democracy and open the doors of reform for the common good. So, if you're not mad now, <laughs> try watching the big pharma film. The body language of uh, when we show the big pharma film and people are just gasping when they see the price increases on these drugs that have gone up thousands of percent with no justification. Anyway, to bring this back home to Oregon, uh, a couple of years ago before I got, I'm retired now and I'm on the board of these healthcare organizations, but I was the director of Main Street Alliance of Oregon, which is an organization organizing small business owners around the state on policy issues at the state and federal level. And my job as an organizer slash director was to go from city to city and survey small business owners. So I would set my GPS to a new town I hadn't been in. And I went everywhere from La Grande to Brookings, from Astoria to uh, Lakes, Lakeside, Lakeview, everywhere in the state. And I would set my GPS to Main Street in the town I was going to, and that would usually put me in the old downtown where the mom and pop stores are. And I would go door to door and say, do you have eight, eight or 10 minutes to answer some questions about policy issues that impact small business? And the people that did would talk for eight or 10 minutes or two hours, and I would do this survey on various policy issues, but a couple of them on the survey panel were electoral reform and healthcare. And what I learned all over Oregon, conservative and liberal, um, in the sampling that I did each year, the majority of small business owners support a universal health care system like a, quote, Medicare for all. That was at about 60 percent. And the majority believe we need to get the corrupting money out of politics. I think the number was even higher in the general public in this film. So it's clear Americans are ready for this. And the thing that's not being, being solved, it's not being solved because of the influence of money in politics. So it's a deadly circle. Um, bringing this home to here in Oregon, 
Two years ago, in 2017, a coalition of a bunch of organizations, including healthcare organizations, Oregon Nurses Association, um, various unions, uh, and even health insurance companies got together and they tried to run a, a modest bill to try to start controlling price increases on pharmaceuticals in Oregon. And immediately, the pharmaceutical industry was putting full-page ads in every newspaper in Oregon. You may have read them uh, two years ago. Full-page ads saying, oh, this is a giveaway to the insurance industry, blah, blah, blah. All the reasons they thought that we shouldn't start to control uh, drug prices. Well, that year, nothing passed. Then last year, this same coalition tried again. And they got a, a modest transparency bill passed. Um, but it was still, pharma was in their meeting with every legislator, and a lot of these legislators get money from insurance and they get money from um, pharma. If this is not just at the federal level. So this year, and for you that are the wonky people that follow this stuff, the coalition has renamed itself and it's called uh, Oregonians for Affordable uh, Phar Prescriptions. O Oregonians. Let's see, Oregon Coalition for Affordable Prescriptions, OCAP, so OCAP. But if you Google that, it's Oregonians for, uh, Oregon, Oregon Coalition for Affordable uh, Prescriptions. And, and it does include a lot of organizations. They're working on f uh, one, two, three, four, five basic bill concepts, allowing importation of cheaper drugs from Canada, 60 day notice before price increases, advertising price disclosures in the um, television ads, substitution of generics and substitution of biologics. These are all modest and um, interesting bills that begin to address the problem. It really needs to be done at the federal level, we all know that, but in the meantime, we're doing what we can here, but the industry will be fighting against it. Um, so this, this, is, this is bringing this home in, in this area um, these are the things that we need to deal with. Um, the, the bills now in the legislature and a ballot measure that's proposed, the two major things that need to be done in Oregon to begin controlling campaign do uh, finance dollars, one is there, our Oregon Constitution has been interpreted to say that um, there can be no uh, limits on campaign finance spending, because uh, it's a freedom of speech um, issue based on the language of the Constitution. So it will take a constitutional amendment in Oregon to tweak the Constitution so that campaign finance limits are legal, and they are legal in many states. And we're one of the few states that doesn't have campaign finance limits. So there is a, a, an initiative petition already collecting signatures for 2020 called IP, uh, 2021, so it's uh, initiative petition, year 2020. It's the first uh, initiative petition. They've already gotten it through the Secretary of State. They're collecting uh, signatures. We've reviewed it. There's pluses and minuses to this, but it needs to be done. And there is also legislation being considered in the legislature that would move in this same direction with a legislative referral to the voters in 2020 um, asking for the uh, power to begin uh, controlling campaign finance, financing. The other issue, uh, uh, putting limits on campaign finance, the other issue brought up in this, um, and a lot of states have done this, is the idea of uh, formulas for public funding. Uh, a representative, Dan Rayfield, out of the Corvallis area, uh, ran a bill two years ago um, on this, and it didn't move. Um, but it is coming back. There aren't specifics available yet, but watch for a pump public financing of elections bill that Dan Rayfield will be running this session. He's kind of working out the legalities of it, so it doesn't even have a, an LC number, a legislative concept number yet, but it is happening. And then the big organization in Oregon to go to for information on this is Common Cause of Oregon. Google Common Cause of Oregon. They are the, they take the lead. And the last time we showed this movie here in Salem, uh, that uh, this movie, yeah, uh, Kate Titus, the executive director of Common Cause, came and spoke about the need for these kind of reforms. And they kind of take the lead on all the bills that have to do with 
cleaning up our electoral system, uh, get on their email list, follow them. They will be taking the lead on reforming um, uh, our campaign finance rules in Oregon. Also, there's a group called Honest Elections Oregon that's in charge of that ballot measure I talked about previously. I think if you Google Honest Elections Oregon, you'll find that group. Um, so that's kind of a summary of why this is important in Oregon and what we can do here. Um, so I guess we could open it up for questions and I understand microphones go around and then I respond to whoever gets the microphone. Um, over here, Sally Shriver. Mm -hmm. um, my thought is let's shorten the time that people have to campaign for any office, president on down, and that much money wouldn't be needed if we did that. That's a great idea, and I know some European countries do have limits on the, the length of that, and that's a really irrational idea. I don't know if we'd get around to that here, but it sounds like a real rational idea to me. Uh. Hi, this is this is Dave. Mm -hmm. um, the United, uh, the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights lists health care. Do you consider health care a human right? Well, um, we did a poll, I, I personally do, and people can argue about it, but we did a poll of Oregon voters in 2014, and around 80% of likely Oregon voters um, believe that healthcare is a human right. So I think a majority of folks think that everybody deserves health care. And, and most industrialized countries have it. And right now, there's this big move in the entire not industrialized world, there's a universal healthcare movement shooting for 2030 to have universal systems in every country in the world. And I, I Google, uh, on, uh, you know, I do a Google search that's just permanently on my computer, and every day I get a list of, of, of newspaper articles from around the world on the phrase universal healthcare, and I hear about efforts to put it in Zambia and St. Kitts and the Philippines, and all of these countries are passing legislation and working on universal health care models. They're, they may not be perfect, but they're all working on it. And it's ironic that the richest country in the country, uh, in, the, in, in the world, hasn't figured it out yet. Uh, back here, uh, could you comment on AARP as being part of the problem in health care? I... Um, we've worked, as Main Street Alliance, we've worked with AARP on a lot of issues, and, and they do do good work on a lot of issues. It, f it feels like to me that their United Health arm, um, which offers a lot of Medicare coverage in, in health insurance, they, they kind of have a conflict of interest on this issue, and I don't see them coming out strong for universal health care because they make a lot of money selling insurance. I'm not saying that they have a conflict of interest, but it feels like it. Another question back on campaign uh, finance uh, that was presented up here, matching federal funds. Oh, yeah. has, uh, has anybody that's uh, putting forth this idea contacted the feds and would they match? I don't know the answer to that. I know a number of states and municipalities have actually done um, matching funding so that this is in place in a number of locations. It obviously hasn't been done at the federal level. There's no reason it couldn't be done, but I don't know if Congress is um, considering it. Uh, Paul here. Uh, a question here. Can states regulate finance limitations on state legislatures and so forth, uh, but couldn't do it for federal, that would take a federal law, but can states still uh, individually put limits within their state for local elections? They, they can and they do in a number of states. In Oregon, we've been kept from doing that by that constitutional, uh, that court decision on our constitution. That means we need to um, amend the constitution to be able to do it. I can see it here. Speaking of court decisions, 
since the Citizen United decision, we've had a number of changes on the or on the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court. Um, are there any foreseeable changes that could happen that would allow the Supreme Court to revisit Citizens United in whole or in part and maybe make a change? Because that clearly the lawyers all think that's a terrible decision. Yeah. Um, and incidentally, Oregon was one of the states whose legislature passed a resolution asking uh, Congress to address Citizens United by, um, well, the, the um, it, but in answer to your question, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I'm, I'm not sure on that. Um, uh, I, I really don't know. <laughs> uh, this is Evelyn. I'm just curious about when healthcare and health insurance and all that became for profit. Seems to me that's when things started to fall apart. That's a good question. Part of the overview of how we ended up with a mostly employer based healthcare system. Um, folks um, in, uh, believe that during World War II, when price increases were controlled by the government because we're trying to fight a war, um, the way you could reward workers was to give them health care and benefits, like uh, additional benefits besides pay. And so it's felt that we built our employer-based system uh, because of uh, World War II and that we stayed on that track, and, and we've stayed on that track. Um, so. Um, uh, where Canada in 1960, which was about the same, they, they were spending about the same amount as we were on health care in 1960, but a prime minister in Saskatchewan, Tommy Douglas, proposed that they should have what they called Medicare, which was covering everybody in their health. Um, and they passed a Medicare bill, and the doctors actually went on strike um, because they were afraid they were going to make less money. And there was a, um, an interesting piece in Canadian law that uh, British doctors can, can practice in Canada. So a bunch of strike-breaking British doctors came over to Saskatchewan, broke the strike, but within about three weeks they actually negotiated everything out. And they got it figured out in Saskatchewan, and by the 1970s, Canada... Um, uh, had universal health care throughout the, the country, and now uh, they spend half as much as we do per capita on health care. Um, we, we spend twice as much as they do per person on health care because they've kept the cost of health care down uh, due to this um, single-payer Medicare for all type system. Hi, this is, <clears throat> this is Don. Uh -huh. um, I, I would point out that there's several candidates now for president that yeah. are saying universal health care, uh, the battle started, uh, you know, Medicare for all. And the other side is now saying, oh, my God, look at those crazy yeah. socialist liberals. And, uh, you know, I think at some point it's an idea whose time has come, and maybe we watch what's going on. Uh, it's going to happen. You're, you're right, and it's really interesting. Again, on that Google I do every day of universal health care, New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, all the major papers, every other day there's something about Medicare for all. I mean, it is on the, the nation's mind now and it is in the conversation. So from a few years ago, it's, it's amazing we've come this far in terms of public interest and the polling is really high in the public in terms of supporting it. So do we wanna uh, end questions now? So do you take a break at this point before? Okay. Oh, well, let's uh, be back in 10 minutes. All right. Well, welcome back. I hope everybody had a good break. And this is a good group, and I think you're going to, on the quiz questions, I think you're going to do better. Most people don't know the answer to a couple of the quizzes, but since you guys are into continuing education, I can tell you're a sharp group. So I'm part of those organizations like we discussed, and a retired movie theater owner. I helped Loretta at the Salem Cinema with some of the Salem Film Festivals, I mean, as a volunteer. So that was fun. <laughs> And that's a great theater, by the way, to see great films. We like the documentaries, too. Um, so uh, this is the quiz question. How, uh, raise your hand if you know the answer to this. One, two. Oh, look. Oh, this is blowing. I've only had every audience is one person. So tell me what this is. That's right. 
this is where the settlers uh, gathered in Shampui to decide whether to go with uh, Britain and ending up Canada or going with the states. And it was about a hundred and some people. And um, a couple of the French, tra that was, but whatever it was, there were a few French trappers and they voted with the people who wanted to go to the US instead of going with the Brits. And, uh, uh, but for a 52 to 50 or whatever the vote was, we would have universal health care now because we'd be part of Canada. <laughs> this whole picture, you know, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. The greater Cascadia, yay! So um, we'd already have public health care because of the guy I talked about before, Tommy Douglas, who in 1962 pushed uh, Medicare in Saskatchewan and then it spread across Oregon. I mean, Canada. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be easier. Thanks. That's good. Oh, good. Nice. Okay. So, um, and as I mentioned, back in 1960, our, our health care was the same price as uh, Canada's. But as the years went on, the U.S. price went higher and higher, and the Canadians went up, but it went up at a slower rate so that now... Um, we pay twice as much as they do for health care. Um, first of all, we've got to talk about the book that is the Bible of the universal health care movement. T.R. Reid, who was a New York Times and a Washington Post writer, lived in England, lived in Japan, had a lot of experience with health care systems, and he wrote about them, and he actually talks about the various models, because people talk about single payer a lot, but actually there's a lot of different universal health care systems, three main ones actually. And this book covers it, T.R. Reid, The Healing of America. There's also a PBS special that he did, you can Google. Um, but he is living in Colorado working on the universal health care movement there, where they had a ballot measure a couple of years ago attempting uh, health care for all, but it didn't happen. Um, the three basic types that T.R. Reid outlines is a strictly regulated universal insurance system like used in, uh, in countries like Germany and Japan. They aren't single payer. They are insurance companies, but they're nonprofit and they're highly regulated. And there's a control so that everybody's kind of paying the, th the same and everybody in the country ha has health coverage. The second is systems like the UK which is the National Health Service, which is socialized medicine. It is run by the government, the hospitals, the doctors, everybody are, are employees of the government. The third kind, and it's actually in the minority, is a single payer system like Canada. And funnily enough, in the 1990s, Taiwan, which had been living in a one-party state since they had broken off from Red China on the mainland, um, their conservative party was now facing um, multi-party elections, and they decided they wanted to do something nice to outmaneuver the more progressive party that was coming in. So they decided they wanted to do universal health care, and they studied a bunch of countries, and they said, Canada's system looks really simple, and we could do it really quick. So they adapted a single-payer system, and they had it in place in just a couple of years, and for whatever political um, gain they made from it. Uh, they have one of the best healthcare systems in the world now. Okay, but going way back, um, the answer is actually here, you don't have to know, but the first uh, national healthcare system was in 1893, and it was not a, a flaming liberal, it was uh, Chancellor Otto von Bismarck who was trying again to head off the growing socialist movement in Europe by giving benefits to the workers. And also, if you have healthy workers, you have a strong economy. And so they built, built the first national health insurance program uh, in 1893, starting in 1893. Again, uh, when you talk about going to universal health care, those arguing against it often say, oh, socialized medicine, we don't want to do that. But um, the two... Mm, mm, um, Socialized systems we're aware of are NHS, the National Health Care Service in England, and the Veterans Administration, which is a government-run health care system. And we hear about certain problems in it, but a lot of people that work in that system and a lot of veterans actually do attest that there's a lot of good work done by the VA. We, I'm not going to debate that today. Um, 
comparing healthcare systems and health outcomes, the US ends up down at the bottom in a lot of comparisons on things like infant mortality and various measures of healthcare outcomes. Um, we're down at the bottom under UK, Switzerland, et cetera. Um, life expectancy is higher in a lot of these universal healthcare countries. Um, and the per cap capita cost of healthcare, um, we're twice as much as the average of the developed countries' healthcare costs. Um, and, and so we're, we're spending twice as much as countries that can cover everybody in the country adequately, um, and we're not covering everybody. Uh, that's the same concept there with more countries. Um, that's the OECD average in the middle in red, and that's us, uh, us in the far left. We're at actually above 18%, closer to 19% now. This is a couple of years old. So, how, 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 much, how long ago did we try to start doing universal health care? Teddy Roosevelt, running as a, on the pro Progressive Party in 1912, was advocating for a universal uh, health insurance program. And he cited the German. He said, what Germany has done uh, in the um, um, behalf of old age pensions or insurance should be studied by us and adapt the system to our uses. So he was recognized, the Germans were ahead of us, e even in 1912. Moving up to the Depression, of course, the other Roosevelt uh, was going to try for universal health care in the Social Security Act, but the American Medical Association convinced him that wasn't a good idea, and, and it didn't happen. And then uh, Truman uh, tried for a national program and again, the AMA came in, and, and a, a couple from California that had done some advertising campaigns against universal uh, health care in California did a national campaign calling this socialized medicine. It was the most expensive advertising campaign on a political uh, issue to date. And they put out all the regular uh, stuff about socialized medicine, and, we, and, and that became kind of the meme that's ever since been brought up when we try to talk about universal health care. Then Lyndon Johnson signed the Medicare and Medicaid Act in 1965, which I think most of us in this room appreciate at least one, if not both of those. Um, and uh, so now 750,000 Oregonians, 55 million Americans have Medicare, and 74 million Americans have Medicaid, and almost 1 million Oregonians, so one out of four Oregonians benefits from a federal health care program. So they have health care for all for a quarter of the population. Um, and then Richard Nixon actually wanted, wanted to try to do something with a national insurance program, but um, that didn't happen. And we remember the TV campaigns and the battles around Hillary Care. And finally, there was some progress in the journey toward getting more people covered and having a system that would, would have less people go bankrupt over health costs uh, when the Affordable Care Act passed. Um, it ended, discrimina it ended um, discrimination against pre-existing um, exclusions, and it expanded coverage to 20 million more people. That was very, very important. But the insurance continues to cost too much. The price keeps going up. Deductibles and co-pays are out of sight. Often people have $5,000, $8,000 deductibles. Who goes to the doctor if they've got an $8,000 deductible? Um, it is the major cause of bankruptcies in the United States. In all these other countries, zero people go bankrupt. Zero people go bankrupt because of health care costs. Um, no transparency, confusing options. So um, our, mo our motto is why not go all the way? Healthcare for all Oregon started at the turn of the century um, with a mission to create a comprehensive, equitable, publicly funded, high quality, universal health care system serving everyone in Oregon and eventually the United States. Um, there was about, how many were aware of the ballot measure, Measure 23 in 2002? Oh, this is a really good group. There's a, actually people that know about that. So there was a ballot measure to try to get, quote, single payer health care and Healthcare for all, a small group, mainly out of Eugene, um, was kind of the think tank behind it, and they ran this bill, and it, 
we acknowledge, I wasn't around at the time, but we acknowledge as a movement that at, at that time, um, it was so poorly written that all the unions in Oregon, except the Oregon Nurses Association, not only weren't neutral, they were against it. So some of our potential allies were against it, so it was not well written. So if you move forward up toward the Obamacare debate, a group of physicians in Oregon from the national group called Physicians for National Health Program, PNHP, and if you go to their website, there's a lot of data, and over 50% of uh, physicians in the country now support this idea. But uh, they call this group of PNHP doctors from Oregon put themselves in some campers and traveled across the country branding themselves as the mad as hell doctors and doing comedy routines, music, uh, talks on the need for universal health care. And it was basically um, barnstorming on the idea of uh, Medicare for all. And then they and other advocates ended up in Washington, D.C. And Congress and Obama basically said this idea was off the table and we got what we got with um, Obamacare and then we needed to move on. So um, after the passage of Obamacare, we supported the improvements that were happening and we were happy that more people were covered. But we began to build a larger statewide coalition and we began running bills um, on a single payer type healthcare model that could be implemented in Oregon. There's a waiver under the Affordable Care Act called the, um, uh, I'm losing the number, uh, but there is a waiver that's available that uh, a state can negotiate with the Center for Medicaid and Med Medicare Services and uh, waiver certain regulations and actually take the federal money in and then create like a universal system. Wyden put this um, waiver in the uh, Affordable Care Act. Nobody's used it yet because nobody's passed the enabling legislation, but the first state that does will sit down with CMS and, and negotiate. We've run bills in 2011, 13, 15, 17, and 19, and so we're in session. Our bill this year doesn't have a bill number, but it has a legislative concept number, 1927. It's LC1927. We'll soon have a bill number, and the lead sponsor is uh, Representative Manning from North Eugene. Um, in the meantime, we started running a bill to create a study on how to get to universal health care in Oregon. And we passed the bill in 2013, but the legislature wouldn't fund the study. So we came back in 2015, asked them to fund the study. They did that, and some money was put together. It was put out to bid to national research groups. The RAND Corporation, which has done a lot of really important healthcare studies in the last few years, won the bid, did the study, and it was presented uh, to the 2017 legislature. And basically, it, it was looking at four ways to get to universal health care. One would be like a public option that we've heard about, where you buy into um, uh, um, Medicare for all type thing. Another was called an essential health benefits program that would have been more like a, a basic primary care thing that would be less expensive than a single payer. The other would be a single payer where we, we do move toward a fully unified system that takes the waste out of the system. And the fourth option was more like uh, the control option, which is the Affordable Care Act as it is. When the RAND Corporation reported to the legislature, they said basically there's a lot of political challenges to get from point A to point Z to do this, but if you want the most affordable health care, with the single payer system, we could cover everybody in Oregon well with what we're spending on health care now. So that was kind of the conclusion. So out of that, a Representative Greenlick, uh, the chair of the House Health Care Committee, created a universal access to care legislative work group that operated from January of last year until this last November and did its report to the legislature and an interim session in December. And basically, they kind of agreed. Um, this is the group meeting, and, they, and this group had Kaiser, they had Pacific Source, they had rural health, they had mental health, they had the hospital association, they had advocates like us that are, are you know, pushing for a health care for all. And, um, and they had two Democrat and one Republican legislators in the group, even the Republican, and all the group was really coming to consensus that we need a radical change in our health care system to get to a universal health care system. They didn't get to the point that they 
put together a tax package on how you would pay for it and what it would look like as a bill. But some other ideas were generated, including an idea for a universal primary care system that would be a lot less expensive than a full universal system. So there's a couple of bills that are going to be toyed with this session, one on primary care, and another would be a buy into the Oregon Health Plan, so people could just actually buy Oregon Health Plan as an option on the exchange. That also would require negotiation with the feds, but these are interesting ideas. So the conversation about universal health care has reached a really high level. Sitting, I, I went to almost every one of these meetings, and they were so amazing. These are smart people that have been that, that are on, in the room on this, and they um, did a great job. Um, meanwhile, this movement that was just a small group began to pull people together, the Physicians for a National Health Pro Program, various churches, various community groups, a group in Corvallis called the Mid-Valley Healthcare Advocates that's been around since the 90s. And so we now have 120 supporting organizations. We have been getting businesses and signing on as supporters of this idea of universal health care. We have 33,000 people in our database. And I uh, um, don't feel compelled, but if you are interested in either learning more or supporting what we're doing, Fill this out and let's pass these around. Oh, I have another pin here. Where'd it go? Okay. And and then if you guys can p pass it to the middle after you get done. And then I have our basic flyer that gives you all our contact information for healthcare for all Oregon. And we have this cute young lady from. I think she's from Bandon that was at this um, rally we had. Um, that rally was, we had about 1,200 people in front of the Capitol. I think that was 2015. And we have 14 chapters. We have an HCO Marion County chapter and a presence around the state. Um, so what is happening? Um, somebody mentioned the Medicare for All being the talk around the country. 25 states like Oregon are working on building state-based systems, and we meet once a year. Uh, it was in Chicago, Minneapolis, New York, Las Vegas, and we meet and talk about how we're doing at the state level. Um, uh, Oregon, we're thinking the legislature will never pass this, and eventually we need to go to ballot measure. It does require tax hikes, and you know how popular tax hikes are in Oregon. So what we think is we need to talk to Oregonians, get them ready to vote uh, counterintuitively to raise their taxes to have a universal health care system. Um, California almost made it last year. Uh, SB 562 got through the Senate, um, but then it got stalled in the Assembly. And it's a pretty robust single-payer bill, and they have huge coalitions, and the Cal California Nurses Association is pushing this really hard. Uh, but They'll be coming back this year, and now Gavin Newsom, who was just elected governor, who developed a universal health care plan in San Francisco when he was mayor, is now saying, we are going to try to get there. To, uh, and if California goes, the fifth largest economy in the world, uh, the whole country eventually is going to go. Um, another thing that was interesting was back when the current Congress started saying, well, let's rip up, rip up the Affordable Care Act. If you remember, people started coming out in droves on that question. The bottom picture is up in Portland, where I think several thousand people showed up for a forum that the legislators were at, and they were upset about the idea of, of cutting back the Affordable Care Act. And uh, Representative Blumenauer got up and he said, maybe we should look at this single-payer deal again. And the whole crowd went, yeah! And a week later, he signed on to the House single-payer bill, which is H.R. 676. Bonamici signed on, DeFazio signed on. Our local, Representative Schrader, we've been bugging him, but he's not signed on. And so, if you know him. Uh, um, and um, in Congress, um, the original Conyers bill, H.R. 676, moved over to Ellison when Conyers left Congress. Um, and it now had, it had about 100 and 30 sponsors at last count, including our three. Uh, and then Bernie Sanders in 17 
offered a Senate Medicare for All bill. There's a debate over which is the best, the House or the Senate bill, but they're both going. And now, um, Representative Pramia uh, Jayapals from Washington has taken over the House bill, and there's now a House Medicare caucus, a Medicare for All caucus with 70 members, and um, she has rewritten the original Conyer bill, HR 676, is going to have a new bill number within a week, and they're collecting sponsors for the rollout of a well, well um, amended Medicare for All bill that um, national organizations are going to be pushing. So there's a lot of energy going on in the country about this conversation. And our question is, how much further till we get to healthcare for all? And these are, again, some of the resources that are available. The book, Healing of America by T.R. Reed. These films uh, by the person of the, we watched the movie today, but Big Pharma uh, and Fix It. And then two movies, a uh, healthcare movie, and now is the time. And then Sick Around the World is the PBS documentary on T.R. Reed's ideas about a national, international healthcare systems. So I think that's an overview of where we are. So maybe we could go into quest oh, questions again. Earth calling. Okay. Hi. Oh, hi. Is this on? Okay. Hi. Over here. Okay. Over here. Oh, everybody raises their hands, so I'm looking at all the hands. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hi. My name is Joan. Hi. Um, on the statistics, the numbers about um, how much more is paid for healthcare in the United States than in other countries, do, does that number include costs of insurance? It 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 includes the overhead of managing the healthcare system, which includes the paperwork and overhead on the insurance side, the paperwork and overhead on the doctor's side, the paperwork and overhead on the hospital side, so that the admin costs of healthcare, which is basically paper pushing, um, it, it's not really a third, but there is an argument to say out of $3 trillion that we spend on health care in the United States, almost a third of that is not on health care. It's on pushing paper, profits, or advertising. Up here on, on, in the back, uh -huh. uh, my name is Jenks. And the last time I looked in most cities, the biggest and best buildings are usually insurance companies. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, since most of them are profit and not nonprofit, yeah. we go to them and say, oh, by the way, we're going to change the rules of the game for medical insurance. What are they? Well, I can tell you I, what they're going to do, but. They're going to go to war. <laughs> yeah. How, what's it going to look like and how do we get past that part? Yeah, that's, that's a super, super good question because uh, a lot of the countries that decided to go another way, did it before their in insurance industry got so big. And so we do have big opposition in this, and there's a lot of argument. But we had Gerald Friedman, who is a, an economist at Ma uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst, did a study for us before the RAND study a few years ago. And just just for the, the folks that do are concerned that a lot of people in insurance companies, a lot of people that are you know coding claims and stuff, are all going to lose their jobs. Um, and uh, his study indicated that when you make the transition to single payer healthcare and with all the money you save, um, you're gonna cover more people, but you're also freeing up money that's wasted in the economy now because it's now t almost 20% of our GDP is in healthcare. When you can shrink the size of healthcare, some of that money is going into the economy, improving the economy, making more jobs and more healthcare jobs because we're covering more people. So in Oregon, if we had gone to a single payer system and had started it in 2019 by this study in 2014, 15, um, we would have had a net gain of 50,000 jobs in Oregon due to the economic stimulus effect of, of doing this transition. Um, but the, your basic question of how we're going to beat the insurance companies, that's, that's going to be a toughie because we need a few uh, donation, donors on our side when they come in with $30 million to defeat us. Hi, uh, my, my name is Pete. Uh, my question is, 
uh, regarding uh, liability insurance that pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, doctors, mm -hmm. et cetera, have to pay because we're a society that's quick to sue when something goes wrong. And what is the cost attributed to the health insurance on that? That's a good question, and often uh, folks that are less um, moving toward a radical change. Uh, we get the argument about, what do you call that when it's uh, it's a legal, uh, there's a word for that. Um, it's the reform, it's it, it's tort reform, I, I forget. the. Yeah, it's, it's about um, limiting the amount you can sue and so forth, but that's such a small percentage, and I don't know the exact number, but of the entire, of that $3 trillion in healthcare, it's a minor percentage. It doesn't solve a lot to, to get some of that legislation in place. That's, that's a piece you could do, but it doesn't save much in terms of saving money. Okay, Pat here. Uh, with insurance going up higher every year, I've heard that there's two companies, maybe there's more that sh charge no premium, and someone said you get what you pay for. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm wondering about that. Well, I'm not sure what companies don't charge premiums. I don't, I, I don't know what that is. I know there's a, there's a couple of uh, things floating out there. Some doctors are trying to not use insurance anymore, and they're doing this kind of cash uh, per month fee for people. And I think that's interesting and it's not a totally bad idea, but you end up having to have catastrophic insurance anyway because it's not gonna cover you. That $60 or $100 a month you're paying to your doctor is not gonna cover you if you end up in heart surgery at the hospital. It isn't gonna cover you. <laughs> um, Sally Shriver back here. Um, you've mentioned, I think universal healthcare sounds great. Yeah. But how about, you haven't mentioned the care that people get, because I know a lot of people come down from Canada to be uh, serviced. And also you've not mentioned uh, the, the uh, medications, which are going sky high. Yeah, good, both good points. Um, there's a lot of data, and I can't exactly cite the data, but we're going to be re releasing another film by Richard Master. It's a 12-minute film called Debunking the Myths of Canadian Healthcare, because actually they've polled Canadians and they love their healthcare system, and a, actually a relatively few people actually come to um, the U.S. Too close? Okay. For... Um, elective surgery. It does happen, but it's relatively few. On the other side, we definitely, besides focusing on getting to universal health care, our group Health Care for All Oregon is working with that coalition that I mentioned that's working on pharma prices. And it's, it's a crisis in this country. And um, I mean, this is why people are going bankrupt. I was at, a, I was at the Minneapolis conference and I was um, uh, waiting for my cab with a woman that has MS whose medication would cost her thousands of dollars a month and she can't take her medication uh, because she can't afford it. And th this, is a, this is criminal. So we have to solve it. Here, my name is Lucy. Um, question, in the big pharma tent, Kaiser Permanente purports to be a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Um, are they in the big pharma tent, or where do they stand on universal health care? Well, first of all, um, Kaiser is both a provider and, and insurance, so they're kind of on both sides of the fence. There's a, I mean, some people like Kaiser, some people don't like Kaiser, but I had Kaiser when I was in California, and their original concept was the idea of per capita payment. So everybody pays X amount a month, and they get their health care, and that's it. And actually, in a way, that's that's not a bad idea. And there's there's things we could learn from Kaiser. We have our chairperson of our metro chapter of Healthcare for All is a retired Kaiser executive who really believes in this stuff. And every time we turn around, and Mitch Greenlick is a retired Kaiser um, researcher that our guy Ken knows really well. And he believes in universal health care. So Kaiser and a lot of people in the insurance industry actually get it that we need to move in this direction. Right now, insurance companies are part. So we have a million people in Oregon that are on 
um, Oregon Health Plan, which is Medicaid, and it's managed by coordinated care organizations that are locally based. And those are partnerships of several organizations, but every one of them has a an insurance company as a partner, but they're not selling any insurance. The, the feds are paying for all this. Um, they're not making any money as insurance people. They're helping manage a coordinated care organization because they have expertise in that as well. So there may be a place for the insurance companies ultimately in the universal model in Oregon or in the United States. Oregon. Some single payer people would disagree with me on that, but. Here. Um, hearing Pete talking about insurances, um, I have a plan called HealthNet. Mm -hmm. It's the Ruby plan. Mm -hmm. Me too. No <laughs> monthly payment. Mm -hmm. And I've been on it for four years. And at the time I got on it, I had been going to Blue, I had Blue Cross, and they had their premiums had skyrocketed. And I decided I'd give it one year try and see if it was really too good to be true. And I paid $10 to see my doctor, yeah. and I was able to keep my same doctor. And as many people know in here, I had a catastrophic uh, disaster. <laughs> I broke my back, and I thought, oh, gosh, now I'm really going to find out that they're not going to be. They covered everything mm -hmm. except for my physical therapy that I paid $35 each time for only 12 sessions. They paid everything. And I cannot rate them high enough. They were wonderful. Well, I've, I've had a good experience with, I have HealthNet Ruby myself, and I've had a pretty good experience. A lot of the experts on healthcare are saying that the Advantage plans are actually costing the government a lot more than standard Medicare. And there's some hidden costs there because as they're taking out of my social security check some money on my health care, and that has to do with my health care, and I don't know how that fits with Ruby. And I do know that I went in for some eye surgery, and I ended up with some additional bills and stuff. So they're saying that the Advantage plans are actually costing the taxpayers more and that they're not really a, the Medicare for All we'd be um, asking for is an improved Medicare for All. Right now, A, B, C, D, uh, you know, alphabet soup is not the way to run a healthcare system. Everybody should be covered. Everybody should be taking care of the procedures they need. And and it doesn't need the insurance companies and the advantage, but I, I agree with you that I'm happy I have it right now. Hi, I, I have two questions. One of them is what's not to like. That's the last question. I've been a member of Kaiser for 50 years, over 50 years. And I've never seen anything wrong with it. I've never had any problems with them. I agree. I liked Kaiser when I was with them in California. They, they In a way, the original model when the Kaiser Permanente, the corporation, decided to cover people, it was the idea of let's do inexpensive health care. Let's charge everybody a little bit a month, and then we'll put it in a pool, and everybody will get covered. And that's actually what we're talking about, is let's put er everybody put some money in the pool, and we're all covered. Same thing. Ready? OK. Uh, my name is Bob. This is a very complicated subject, and I yeah. don't pretend to have any expertise. But I was legal counsel to the Public Employees Benefits Board. Mm, yeah. So uh, I got to watch as a fly on the wall some of their policy work. And one of the things that impressed me about them was that their, their spending power gave them enormous leverage. Yeah. And so my question is, with respect to the Oregon Health Plan, how is the state using its enormous uh, economic leverage as a consumer of insurance or consumer of services, I think it's insurance in this case, to uh, establish reform. It seems to me that the middle path, without threatening the insurance companies, is let them do business with those who can do business with them and take over that part of the market that isn't being covered, using their uh, using the taxpayer dollars as leverage for reducing uh, pharma, pharma co pharmacological costs and, and other things. Yeah, I think I think um, it. it, it it, it appears that the state isn't using, just like the federal government isn't using their negotiating power as well as they could, or things would be cheaper. Oh, oh, is it too close? Is it like fuzzing? Yeah, sorry. Um, and 
um, the argument Richard Masters has is like Italy, they talk to all pharma and says, we're the country of Italy and this is what we're gonna pay. We're gonna negotiate, but this is, we're gonna work toward a fair, for pri fair price. And you're right, we need to use our negotiating power, but because of the fractured healthcare system we have, where there's employee healthcare, there's state healthcare, there's VA, there's Indian health plan, there's this, there's that, there's 100 insurance companies, there's all of this overhead in all of those worlds that just mean we're wasting a lot of money, where if you had one single negotiator negotiating for all of us, then we'd have a, a single system where everybody's covered and cheaper. Okay, this is Mika. Oh, is this on? Okay. Um, this is a real simple question. I'm just confused on terminology. Mm -hmm. Medicare is single payer? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when they say Medicare for all, is that what they're talking about? Yeah, so Medicare now is single payer for all of, all of us, us that are on Medicare. Um, there is one payer paying for all of us. It gets more complicated because of the Advantage plans because insurance companies are dipping into that pot and doing some subpots, so it's not perfect single payer, but yeah. And then Medicaid is another single payer um, because one pot from the feds is paying for a million people in Oregon. If there aren't any more, oh, there is another question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm David. Uh, I have a friend who lives in Alaska, but he married somebody from New Zealand, and whenever they need any medical work, they fly back to New Zealand. Yeah, I do hear those stories too, yeah. And I, I was just talking to people that said they go to Mexico for it too. I actually got my braces done in uh, Honduras, Central America many years ago. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeanette. I just want to say thank you for your presentation and I and a special thank you for the first part where you informed us about the significance of campaign finance mm -hmm. reform. You know, it's. I think it's really hard for citizens to get their heads around how significant that is that mm -hmm. that shapes everything that happens. Kind of goes back to the the book David Corton wrote when when corporations rule the world. Right. They call all the shots. But thank you for reminding us of that. Yeah. No, you're right. All of these things. All of these things. Like. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> ah, I never learned. I just can't hear it that well, I'm good bit. So um, all of these things, e every improvement that we need in this country depends on us grabbing our democracy back. Right now, a lot of large corporations are kind of running the democracy and we need to take it back and, um, and get um, it being the people's vote again. Well, Lee, I heard you at the library, and I was so impressed. And thank you for coming and sharing it with the group here. It was good for me to hear it all again. <laughs> um, and uh, I really appreciate all that you had to share. Thank you. Great.